OK, question one. How would you describe the two kings ruling styles? Uh, a couple of groups took this question. One group mentioned that we don't have a lot of evidence because most of this poem is about Ulysses wanting to go out on yet another adventure, which is not really related to being king and ruling over a country. But we do have a little bit of evidence for his ruling style if you look at the first stanza. Line three. I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. To meet and dole just means to give out, to hand out. Unequal laws, the footnote tells us, means rewards and punishments. And he calls his people a savage race, a wild people, uncivilized people. And he says that his people hoard, collects resources, sleep, feed, which means eats, and don't know me. They don't recognize their king. They don't care about the government or the laws. So he's saying they're just like animals, right? They collect resources, they eat, they sleep, and that's it. So it does seem like uh, the idea that he's not a very caring or good king probably makes sense. The second half of this question is about his son, Telemachus, and we can find evidence on the next page. Line 33. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle. So a scepter is that stick that uh, kings have to prove that they are the king. And isle just means island. Well loved of me, which means I love him very much. Discerning, which means wise. To fulfill this labor, the labor of being king. By slow prudence to make mild a rugged people. So slowly and carefully can turn these people from wild into civilized. And through soft degrees, which means gradually, Subdue them to the useful and the good. So, so turn my people uh, slowly toward what is useful and what is good. So as the groups who took this question observed, this is a very different style than his father. If his father can only reward and punish, Telemachus can educate and cultivate and make his people better and more civilized. But the two do share a similarity, or at least from the perspective of Ulysses, we always get this idea that his people are a wild people, uncultured, uncivilized, need to be guided and controlled and educated. We don't know if Telemachus believes this, but we do know that his actions as king fit the same idea. He's very concerned about educating and improving the people. And this connects with the historical background of this poem. This poem was written during the Victorian era. The Victorian era was the high point of the British Empire. When British people ruled over many different places around the world, and therefore ruled over many different kinds of people. At the time, the idea was that because we are the empire, we have the better culture. So in order to improve the people that we control, we need to teach them British culture. This is imperialism and colonialism, Zimingzhuyi. So even though they have different ruling styles, it does seem like they rule you from the base, the same basic assumption, from the same basic attitude toward their people. Let's take a short break. When we come back, I have two very important announcements, and then we will continue with the questions.
Question two, what does old age take away? What does old age leave behind? Line 65. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved heaven and earth. So today we are not as strong as in the past. That which we are, we are. So what we used to be as people, we still are today. One equal temper of heroic hearts. Temper here means attitude. So we all feel together our heroic hearts, the hearts of a hero. Made weak by time and fate. So again, no longer as strong, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. To yield means to give up. So it looks like here he's saying that um, we are not as physically strong as we used to be, but we still feel our willpower, our energy, our heroism. So old age takes away physical strength and health, but it still leaves behind your original passion, the kind of uh, attitude and energy that makes you the person that you are. We are what we are. Uh, a couple of groups took this question, uh, and they also agreed that old age takes away strength, health, and sometimes it also takes away memory. Sometimes as you get older, you start to forget things. But for Ulysses, it seems like memory is all that he has. He's still living in the past. He wants to relive his glory days. Uh, and so for him, what is left behind is that urge to adventure and to experience life. So do the groups agree with this idea? I think all of the groups I talked about this question with agree with the basic idea. With old age, you lose things, but you still keep many other things. But we have some small disagreements about what you leave behind, what you still manage to keep. Right? Some groups think that memory goes away. Other groups think that memory is basically the, the most important thing that gets left behind. But there's also something else in the poem that is not in this part. Um, on page two, he talks about the past, his glory past, right? Lines, uh, starting line six. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees, which means I will enjoy all of life. The lees are what's left at the bottom of a wine glass. So I would drink life to the lees means I would drink all of life. This is also a famous line. Sometimes you will hear, hear people quote this line. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts, the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. So if, if you don't understand this line, you can guess what it means, right? The previous line, it says, those that loved me and alone. So these are opposites. So after the semicolon, on shore, and so this should be the opposite of on shore. So maybe it's at sea, Hang Hai Si. Uh, the scudding drifts, the rainy Hyades, vex the dim sea just means the stormy sea. It's not a peaceful sea. Shung Tao Hai Lang. I am become a name. So all I have left is my reputation. 
for always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners. Manners here means culture, different kinds of behavior. Climates, councils, governments. Myself not least, but honored of them all. So of, of everything I have seen, of all the countries and governments that I have met, I am honored by all of them. And drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. So this is about the Trojan War. I am a part of all that I have met. And he names what this is. He calls it experience. So this is also something that only comes with old age. Experience. Experience does not just mean doing things. Doing things is just having fun. Experience is when you do things and you think about them and you start to make sense out of you, what you have done. Experience is doing things and then reflecting on them and learning from them. So with old age, sometimes you will get more experience, but sometimes you will not. If you don't learn from what you have done, you don't get more experience. In that case, you would just be an old person. Yi lao mai lao. That's question two. Number three. Uh, we're moving on to the next poem. What's the relationship between the speaker and his previous wife? Let's go to page five. The first line here near the end. She had a heart. How shall I say too soon made glad too easily impressed? She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. I can some of those she won. Sir, it was all one did I show though young. My favor at her breast favor means love, so my love for her. The dropping of the daylight in the west. So this is sunset. The bow of cherries, some officious fool, broke in the orchard for her. So when somebody else brings her some cherries. The white mule she rode with round the terrace. A mule is kind of like a horse. In Chinese, we call this luozi. It's the it's uh, the the child of a horse and a donkey. So according to the speaker, his previous wife liked these four things equally. His love for her, the sunset, somebody else's cherries, and her horse. Let's continue. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. So all of these things would make her give like a approving, say something of approval. She would say, yes, it, it's great. I like it. Or at least it would make her blush. Her, her face would turn red. Blushing today is a sign of embarrassment. But in older times, blushing is a kind of um, what is this? Uh, body language. A woman would consciously make her face blush to express her happiness or her joy or some positive feeling. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. So here the speaker is saying when she got married to me, she took my name and my name is an old and important noble name. It's a 900 year old name. 
but she treats this gift just like any other gift. So up to this point, we start to understand what kind of relationship this is. The man really cares that his wife should show gratitude, appreciation, and love. But his wife was just happy at everything. She didn't care whether it came from her husband or from the neighbor. She liked everything. So it's not a really a good fit. Maybe they should go to couples therapy or something. But it gets worse. If we jump down to line 43 here. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? So yes, every time I passed by her, she smiled at me. But any time anybody passed by her, she smiled at them. So again, not what the man wants. He wants to be treated special because he is her very important husband. This grew. So this situation became worse and worse. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. Together here means all together, which means completely. All smiles stopped completely. Uh, she no longer smiled. There she stands as if alive. They're looking actually at this point, they're looking at a picture of her on the wall, a painting of her on the wall. So after describing their relationship, the speaker says, so this is the person you, you're seeing right now, just like she's alive. So does that mean that she's not alive? Is she dead? Right, it says, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. So she stopped smiling. Did he kill her? If he did kill her, then it would no longer just be a question of a bad match. It seems like uh, he probably should not get married again. Right at the beginning, we can say, oh, he just wants more love from her and she doesn't know how to express the difference between like somebody she's married to and somebody she just likes. But by the end, when he kills her, we know that the bigger problem is with him, not with her. It doesn't seem like there was. Actually, here it says here. Uh, line 34, you think, OK, so he has a problem with her. Maybe they should communicate, right? But here, line 34, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Trifling means a small thing. Stoop. In Chinese, we would say zhe yao. Like who would uh, insult oneself to blame somebody for this small thing? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, so even if you could communicate this problem, which I cannot, right? He says, I have not. So I don't know how to talk about this. Even if you could say just this or that in you disgust me. So like I have a problem when you do this or when you do that. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. So for this you do too little, for this you do too much. So even if somebody told her this, and if she let herself be lessened so, so if she really tried to listen and to learn, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse. So even if she did try to listen and learn and did not try to argue with you, 
in then would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. So even if I could tell her that you should do this, you shouldn't do that. That is too low for me. I would have to give up some of myself to tell her this. And I never bend for other people. So he's saying basically I would rather kill her than communicate with her. So yes, the problem is in this case with the husband. So anyway, I hope this gives you a better picture of their relationship. Number four, why do you think the poem mentions the sculpture of Neptune in the last three lines? OK, so here. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse thought a rarity which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. So as the question says, this is a sculpture of Neptune, Heisen. Taming a seahorse. He, uh, Neptune in this sculpture is controlling a seahorse. Thought a rarity. So the speaker is saying this is a rare sculpture, which means it's a valuable sculpture. Which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me, and the footnote says that Klaus of Innsbruck may be related or connected to the person that the speaker wants to be his next wife. So here he's also like networking. But why Neptune? Neptune in this sculpture that he likes is taming a seahorse. So what he likes about this sculpture is that the sea god is controlling this animal. Is making the animal do what it he wants it to do. So it looks like the speaker values control. The same kind of control that he did not have over his previous wife. So the poem points out the similarity between his attitude toward this sculpture and his attitude toward his previous wife. Suggesting that maybe he thought of his previous wife as more like a sculpture than as a human being. It's like he, his wife is young and beautiful and he hopes that she can behave properly so that he can show her off to his guests and his business partners. But not because he loves her. For the same reason, he likes this sculpture not because it's beautiful, but because it shows control and because it is valuable. So he doesn't love it as a kind of art. He loves it as a kind of. Object. And really like this ending is a brilliant ending to this poem because this poem is basically you see this guy. Talking about his ex wife. And as you listen to him talk, you realize, wait, this guy is a killer. He's crazy, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know that that he appears crazy and appears like a killer. So he thinks that when he mentions this sculpture, it would be a positive thing, right? Look, I'm rich and powerful. I have this valuable sculpture. Look at how powerful this sea god is, just like I am powerful. But for somebody who knows what kind of person he is, this sculpture just tells us that he he's not only crazy, he doesn't know that he's crazy. So but the poem, the poet Robert Browning knows exactly what kind of person this is, and that's why he added this ending to the poem. In literature, we call this irony. 
Uh, irony in Chinese is feng ci, but it's, the meaning is lost in translation. The specific definition of irony is what it looks like is not what it actually is. Biao li bu yi is irony. So this is a classic example of irony. It looks like the dude is trying to show off and win a new wife. What's actually happening is he's showing how crazy he is. He thinks it's positive, it's very negative. Question five. Both of these poems are dramatic monologues. How are they similar? How are they different? I think I've already started to answer this question. So the first poem is about Ulysses wanting to have more adventures. Actually, let me show you the most famous lines. Uh, if you look at page three, the last stanza on this page. Line 44. There lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark, broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles, whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So let me break this down for you. After talking about his past and his current situation, he says, there lies the port, Ganko. The vessel or the ship puffs her sail. There gloom the dark broad sea. So there is the sea, right? There's the port, there's the ship, there's the sea. It's waiting for us. My mariners, a mariner is a sailor. Oh, all of my sailors who have stuck with me throughout all of my life. And when faced with the thunder and the sunshine, so for better and for worse, opposed free hearts, free foreheads. The word opposed means um, brought to bear against. How do I explain this? OK, so you guys know the word against, right? Fandui, against. Against has another meaning. If I lean on the table, you can also say that I am leaning against the table. Because according to Newton's third law of um, uh, motion, every force meets an equal and opposite reaction. Right? So when I lean on the table, I'm actually pushing against the table. So I'm leaning against the table. Here, the word opposed is this same meaning. When faced with good or bad, I push against it with free hearts, free foreheads. So with courage and with honor. So opposed does not mean be against. It just means face with. Use these to face something. Uh, I guess in Chinese it would be like uh, something like 
，无论雷劈还是日照，都扛起自由之心、自由的的前额来面对 ，something like that。And then after the break, you and I are old. So he admits, like, I know we're old, but old people also have honor and also have their own work. Toil means work, their own job. Death closes all, so death is the ending of everything. But before the end, ear means before, there may be something noble to do, something that still needs to be done. And this kind of thing fits not unbecoming means it fits. It fits men that walked with the gods. Because I don't know if you remember, but in the Iliad, not only were there humans, the gods also fought in the Trojan War. So he's saying we are we once walked with gods. We are great people. And then he goes back to describing the situation. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. He's talking about the rocks near the sea. Like they're twinkling, they're they're giving off light, they're attracting him. The long day wanes, so it is ending. The slow moon climbs, night is coming. The deep, the deep means the sea, Haiyang, moans round with many voices. So the sea is calling to him. And so it's not too late to go on another adventure. Now, do you think that this is a positive description of his attitude? In other words, do you think that the poem agrees with him? I think this sounds quite positive. It keeps on describing the glory of the past and the possibilities of the future, even when you're old. So this is the main difference between these two poems. Both of them have a main character with their own perspective, and the perspective may not be the same perspective as the overall perspective of the poem. 主角的视角跟诗的视角未必一样. In Ulysses, the two perspectives go together. The poem agrees with the main character. But in My Last Duchess, using irony, the poem disagrees with the main character and shows the reader why the main character should not be trusted. Let's take a look at uh, My Last Duchess, the beginning. That's my duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. So very first line, it tells you what's going on in this scene. The main character is talking to somebody, and both of them are looking at a, at a painting on the wall. And the painting is of a woman, and the woman is his ex-wife, and his ex-wife is dead. That's why she is his ex-wife. I call that piece a wonder now. So now I think it's a beautiful painting. Does that mean that before he did not think it was a beautiful painting? Maybe in the past, every time he looked at it, he thought of his ex-wife and got angry instead. Fra Pandolf is a painter. Fra, uh, Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. So he only painted her for one day. You, I don't know if you know this. Have any of you been painted before? No, if you ever get painted, you will know it often takes days, even weeks to get a really good painting. So this painter only spent one day. So is it a good painting? Probably not. Would please you to sit and look at her. So they're standing looking at the painting and he says, no, 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 sit down, take a closer look. So they sit. I said Fra Pandolf by design, so I intentionally mentioned this painter. 
for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance. So people like you, strangers like you, have never seen the face in that picture. The depth and passion of its earnest glance, the way that it looks at you. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. So nobody draws the curtain, la qi lianzi, except for me. So the painting is not just on the wall. It's on the wall behind a curtain. So it, that, this does tell us he usually does not want to see the, po the, the painting. Every time he walks by, he does not want to see his ex-wife. Um, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there. So every time I look at the painting, the look that my ex-wife gives me is as if, as here means as if, Rutong. They're asking me how this look came here. So he's thinking the way that his wife looks at him in the painting is very strange. How did this look get here? Why does she look like this at me? So it's probably not a positive, loving look. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. You are not the first person to turn to me and ask me about this painting. This tells us many different things. He said he only show he doesn't show the painting to anybody. And yet more than one person has asked him about the painting. So he's showing the painting now. Why? Because he's trying to get a new wife, so he has to talk about his previous wife. If the only time he shows the painting is when he's trying to get a new wife, and he has shown the painting to more than one person, then this is not the first time he has tried to get a new wife. So this is probably not the first time that he has said all of this stuff. And fortunately, everybody he talks to realizes he's a crazy person and does not grant him a new wife. But he doesn't know this. He does not know that this is what's going on. And that's why we can say that the poem does not agree with its main character. So that's the main difference between these two poems. They both have a main character, but Ulysses agrees with its main character, whereas My Last Duchess thinks that its main character is crazy. Finally, pick a poem. How can you tell it's Victorian? We mentioned that Ulysses has a very imperial idea about what it means to be a king. What about My Last Duchess? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the handout. Women gain some legal rights, but not the right to vote yet. So there is a growing awareness that women are, should also be treated as people and have their own value. Only against this background can we have a poem like My Last Duchess, because the main problem with the main character in this poem is that he killed his wife and he doesn't value her. He doesn't love her. He didn't really think of her as a human being. So, of course, only when people do think that women have value, would they see the problem with this main character. Uh, then you also have, okay, so empire is here, right? Uh, consumerism, Xiaofei At the very end of My Last Duchess, he talks about this sculpture. He doesn't talk about it as art. He talks about it as an object of value, something that he had the money to buy. Yeah. 
And of course, the dramatic monologue is one of the important inventions of the Victorian era. And both of these poems are dramatic monologues. Yeah, those are the main ideas that you can see in these two poems. OK, do you have questions about this week's questions? OK, so I mentioned that I have two very important announcements to make. The first announcement is that last week I gave you the wrong information about the exam. The maximum score is not 40. The maximum score is 25. So 50% of 25 is 12.5. So if you give me four good examples to support your answer, your best score will be 25. If you give me three good examples, you get 22.5. If you give me two good examples, it's 20. If you give me one good example, it's 17.5. And if you try to give me examples, but you fail, it's 15. And if you don't follow the rules, it is 12.5. So when you get your score, please don't be shocked at how low your score is. The highest is 25. The second announcement is that next week is our field trip. Uh, so next week, please don't come here. Please go to our Jiha campus at in uh, Taipei. Uh, we will be you. You will be visiting our department's graduate graduation exhibition. I don't really know what it's called in Chinese. Um, but so this is where all of our seniors have to present their senior thesis or their senior project. And it's organized like a kind of conference. So here's the schedule. It goes from 12.30 all the way to 5.30. You don't have to stay for the whole thing, but you do have to come find me at 2.50, and we're going to take a group photo. This is room 415, 四楼, C五, Do you guys know how to get there? OK, so like, let me show you. This is MRT Jiantan Station, the Jiaoyun Jiantan Zan. And you walk here. This is a uh, Baiding High School, Baiding Gaozong. So you walk, you walk, you walk, and you will see a very tall building here. It's not very far, right? It's not very far. And you have to enter from the side of the building. So this is the building you have to enter from here. And you take the elevator to the fourth floor, or the sixth floor, because the conference has two floors. Um, some of the conference takes place on the sixth floor, and some of it takes place on the fourth floor. 
So if you're interested in the kinds of graduate uh, graduation projects that you can do, you are welcome to come at 1230 and then plan a schedule. Because all of these things are happening at the same time. Right, so like 1 to 130, there's something happening in J415, and there's also something happening at J413, and there's also something happening at J603. Everything is happening at the same time. So plan a schedule. Like look at all of the topics that people are presenting on, plan, choose which ones you're interested in, and plan a schedule so you know where you should be for each half hour. Uh, and then make sure to find me at J415 at 250。好,我用中文講一遍。所以這是研討會形式。研討會的意思是說會有平行場次,同時間會有多間這個多間報告,多間簡報。所以你要自己規劃你每一個半小時你要你想要聽哪一個主題。然後就規劃一下你就這一
please read uh, also two poems. What is this? Here. Right. Page six, we have Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. And then the next poem, page seven, is The White Man's Burden by Rudyard Kipling. So last week, no, sorry, two weeks ago, we mentioned that the Victorian era has two different sides. In the early and middle Victorian period, everybody was optimistic, energetic, uh, full of passion and energy and like spreading British empire and we're going to solve the world's problems. But as the empire slowly collapsed, near the end of the Victorian era, people started becoming more pessimistic. They felt like they were losing control of their empire. British culture maybe could not solve all of our problems. Maybe we have to uh, we, we shouldn't try to, to do so many things. Maybe history does not go in a straight line. Maybe it goes in a circle. So these two poems are from the late Victorian era. This is when people started become, becoming more pessimistic. So Dover Beach is about the feeling that maybe history is not always improving. Look at this line. Um, Hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain. So, you know, very pessimistic poem. But it's a poem about culture that maybe culture and history cannot give us these things. And on page seven, the white man's burden, as you can tell from the title, this is a poem about imperialism, but it's a it's a poem about how hard it is to have an empire. How when you try to give British culture to everybody around the world, nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. You work for them and they, they don't have any gratitude at all. And that even though it's a tough job, we still have the duty to spread empire. So at this point, it's no longer about, oh, what a great job it is. It's what a terrible job, but somebody has to do it. Also quite pessimistic. Um, so next week, go to the thing, and then uh, the week after that, read these. And then I will introduce the next and final literary period, the 20th century. OK, uh, and so I guess two weeks later, yeah, I will we'll talk about the two poems and then I will introduce the next literary period. OK, that's it. See you at Jiha next week.